This evening we're going to uh, look at a major figure, Basui Takusho. Now, he comes out of the 14th century. The uh, famous Kamakura period in Japan. But the reason I selected Basui for tonight is because I like Basui. And I want to share with you Basui. This description and, and uh, biography constitutes only four pages in Three Pillars of Zen. And I'm going to read several sections of it to explore his, his amazing ability to appreciate a question. Everything in, in education, in, in everyday education, and what we devote so much time to, is to get answers. Basui is the master of questions, and that's why I like Basui. He has cultivated the art of the question. Now, Dogen says that questioning alone for its duration is time. That's what time is. If you can hold on to a question, that process of staying with it and seeing its own, its own integrity becomes your question, then there isn't any you left. There is just the questioning state. That's the goal of a question. Internalize it. That's why koan study is so interesting. You finally have to take a koan and it doesn't enter into you until after a period of study you finally get it or it gets you. The question gets you. Once the question gets you, then you can progress. Until a question gets us, we can't progress because then we're still caught within a web of our own answers. Now, the dynamics between experience and question, there's a dynamic between experience and question. And that dynamic between experience and question, Basui lives through. And he lives through it in such a way that he goes through cycles. And by cycles, I mean a certain sequence repeats itself as it gets further and further, but the same stages appear in each. Yet, the same stages appear as it gets more and more profound until finally, if you hold to this question, internalize it and make it your own, the question bursts, the question bursts. There isn't an answer to a question. You see, we think, there are answers to questions. There aren't answers to questions. You only get further and more profoundly involved in what it is. You see, the very nature of a question is very, very important. It's the act, it's the act of questing. It's, see, you can't take a question until you're willing to go on the action of a quest. The quest that you're on is your question. Now, it may be that any kind of question will do. Meaningless ones. What is Mu? What is anything? But with Basui, we can see this progression and see how it develops cyclically and takes on a life of its own until it has the culminating experience. Now, it goes through four stages, something has to occur. 
something has to wake us up. Something has to wake us up. That's, that's the important moment, see. Something has to wake us up. That's the experience. Something has to profoundly affect us. And then you see it's recursive. It turns around, it's recursive. And what it does is that once you then have an experience that awakens the question, you have to shop for an answer. It's only when you see that the answer is totally insignificant that you can then take on the question. Therefore, it inevitably follows that if you're really involved in questing and you then can be satisfied by some answer, your quest is all over and you end it. There's no heroic activity from that point on because it's a very interesting question I want to put to you. Perhaps we can talk about it later. I personally don't think that any answer, I don't think that any answer to any question ever answers it. No qualification. The question is more profound than the answer. The answer is only something that allows you to settle the quest. If you hold on to the mystery of whatever question it is, it's more profound than any answer. Therefore, answers are just stalemates. It's where you stop and give up. Now, once you judge the answer and see its inadequacy, then you can then internalize it. That's the key. You then take the question on. Once you take it internally, it has a life of its own. That's the great cultivation. That's the cultivation. There is no technique. There's no way in which you can do it. There's no method other than you see there's an integrity to the question and you're not going to give it up. When this is held to, this is a natural, this is a natural development of jiriki. Right, jiriki, the power of concentration. Japanese jiriki, the Buddhists use that term quite frequently. But jiriki is really the power that arises once the mind is unified and allows the person to act with spontaneity in a variety of situations that are completely appropriate to the occasion. It allows a certain concentration to take place. That concentration, when it takes place, what does that mean, concentrate? That means to bring it all together so that Concentration is just the natural state of the mind. What it means, though, is that you're not doing the other thing, which is dissipating, dissipating energy and jiriki. So therefore, if it remains contained within itself, and therefore there are no dispersing tendencies, that then is the great mixing bowl. That's what's cooked. That cooks. This peaks into an experience. And that's the danger. That's the danger. Because you may take the experience as an answer. But the experience should be merely another step in the same thing. See, if it peaks into an experience, you should then return. And then return and return and return. Now, Basui carried this on with such remarkable integrity that he is eminently worth studying because there are very few people in history that are ever able to take a question with the kind of integrity that this man did. Therefore, I'd like to just show you how it progresses through four very interesting stages. Now, the background of Basui combines two things. If you take a look at the way in which his, auto, his biographer relates his early experience and his background, you'll see something that's rather remarkable. It combines, his background combines images of Moses and Oedipus in one. So we have a historical individual who combines in these, these twin ways and brings together the Moses tradition and the Oedipus. Let's take a look.
In the year 1327, towards the close of the Kamakura era, that strife-torn, anxiety-ridden period of Japanese history, which produced so many notable religious figures, the Renzai Zen master Basui Tokushu was born. Having had a vision that the child she was carrying would one day become a fiend who would slay both his parents, his mother abandoned him in a field where a family servant secretly rescued and reared him. Two traditions. Let's take the first cycle, seven. Seven years old. At seven, Basui's sensitive religious mind began to evince itself. At a memorial service for his late father, he suddenly asked the officiating priest, for whom are these for, for whom are these offerings of rice and cakes and fruit? Experience. He questions an authority. For your father, of course, he gets an answer. He responds to the answer. He shows and points out the obvious fact that it's hollow and weak. But father has no shape or body now, so how can he eat them? Good. Answer's no good. To this the priest answered, though he has no visible body, his soul re will receive these offerings. Second try. Oh, if he accepts it, no question. But Sui comes back and says, wait a minute. If there is such a thing as a soul, I must have one in my body. What is it like? Hey, all right. What is it like? I'll assume, yeah, okay, all right. All right, I have a soul. Wait a minute, if I have a soul, what is it like? What is it like? Well, questions the authority. Now he has the question, what is it like? Now, it has to be internalized. It has to become more and more concerted. Right? They're, all of the activities have to spin around that. It has to begin to gain an identity of its own, a life of its own. Unless it does that, there's no cultivation of a question. Watch the way it happens. To be sure, it's not unusual. That these are not unusual questions from a thoughtful, sensitive child of seven. For Basui, however, they were only the beginning of an intense, unremitting self-inquiry, which has continued well into manhood. In, ta in fact, until he achieved enlightenment. Even during his play with other children, he was never free of these uncertainties as to the existence of a soul. Ah, see, it takes on a life of its own. It takes a life of its own. My truck. It takes on a life of its own. Even during play with children, right? He still wasn't removed from that question. See, it's staying with him, internalizes. It begins a life of its own. Will he give it up for an answer? Will he have an, yes, he'll have an experience. Now the biographer in this case, we'll see, doesn't focus on the fact that we would like to get as much information as we can about each of these stages. It wasn't written for us, but we'll be able to squeeze the pages to try to get as much as we can from the sequence. His preoccupation with the soul naturally led him to think about hell. In an agony of fear, he would explain, exclaim, how awful to be consumed by the flames of hell. Tears would well up. That's a stage. Wow, he's taking it. If there really is a soul, then of course something must happen to it. Right? Well, if something happens to it, then what's the soul like? Let's go through that agony. Ten. At ten, he, he was often awakened by brilliant flashes of light which filled his room, followed by an all-enveloping darkness. Now he has two sets of experiences in there, one at, uh, 
at 7, 8, another at 10. All we can do is contrast those. Right? What would it be like to be awakened by brilliant flashes of light which filled his room? So, Good question. Oh, that's why I asked him. All right, so look here. He holds the question, it opens up an experience. So here we have two episodes, but the author doesn't tell us, the biographer doesn't tell us what particular way those experiences re-channeled, re sharpened the question that we'd like to see. We can infer it from what comes up. Anxious, anxious, anxiously. Next step. He sought for some explanations of these weird occurrences. Seeking authorities again. Did he accept the answers? But the replies that were forthcoming scarcely allayed his fears. Still had his question. Still work what? Still worthwhile. Still has a dynamic of its own. All right. What does he do with it? He internalizes it. Right. Why? Again and again he questions himself. If after death the soul suffers the agonies of hell or enjoys the delights of paradise, what's the nature of the soul? Now see, he had before, see we have two experiences, one where he's worried about the agonies of hell. Right? And now he's considering, well, there might be the other side, paradise. It might be that the agonies he experienced here, and this question was generated, one was generated out of the light, brilliant flashes of light. If they had any aspect of it that was entrancing to him and positive, it might by extension go here, inference, in any case. All right. Look what he's doing. If after death the soul suffers the agonies of hell or enjoys the delights of paradise, what is the nature of the soul? He moves from what is it like to what is its nature. That's a development. That's a big development. Now he takes the other side. Wait a minute. He says, wait a minute, wait a minute. But if there is no soul, all right, then what is it within me right now that sees and hears? So he takes either I have one or I don't have one. All right. Look at that. See? If after death the soul suffers the agony or enjoys the delights of paradise, right? What's the nature of the soul? Look at these are two extremes, right? Hell and paradise. These are agonies of hell and the delights of paradise. So agony, it can suffer agony, right? It can suffer delight. Two extremes. It can, it, it can, if it could go through extreme cold and extreme heat, would say, well then, how is it that it can go through such extremes? Because certainly, even as we know, if you take steel and dip it into liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, hydrogen, you can just touch it and it'll just shatter into pieces. Right? Anything that you put in intense enough fire, it's gone. It melts, it's gone. Therefore, hey, if the soul can survive these two extremes, then what is its nature? That must be a rather interesting thing. What is its nature? There must be something about it that can endure these extremes and keep its own integrity. What, what is it? What's the nature of it? But if there isn't any, okay, if there isn't any, so if I can't answer that question, okay, but right now I know one thing. All right, I don't have a soul, but I know one thing. There's something hearing right now, my voice. I mean, there is something seeing right now, right? There is something seeing right now. There is something hearing my voice right now within me. All right, if I don't have a soul, what's that? Okay, what's that? All right, I don't know. What's that then? So therefore, now it goes through the second phase, you see. 
we have a right to say that the same stage has come up? Right? He takes that question, what can we expect? Right? It's going to build, he's going to live it, it's going to have a life of its own. And that's in fact what happens here because in an effort, see, his biographer relates that by Basui would often sit for hours stewing over this question building up, internalizing it for hours, right? Stewing over this question in such a state of utter self-forgetfulness that he no longer knew if he had a body or a mind. Right? Totally, now he's got it. Now the question has him. Now he's in a real state. On one such occasion, at what age we're not told, <clears throat> Basui suddenly, directly realized that the substratum of things is a viable emptiness and there is an essence, nothing that can be called a soul, a body, or a mind. Bam! Hey, there's a viable emptiness that underlies the substratum of all existence. Wow! All right? Experience. Peeks into an experience. Ah! Right? Wow! suddenly sees that beneath right, the substratum of all existence, whatever it might be, that's not just an emptiness, not just a shunyata, right? It's not in that negative sense. He adds a very important word to it, a viable, right? A viable emptiness, a dynamic to it, right? Viable emptiness. Therefore, in that, there ain't no little piece called the mind a soul, an ego, or anything else. There is only a viable emptiness. You know, I, um, I think the word viable is the word they use to describe sperm. Mm -hmm. When sperm become capable of impregnating, mm -hmm. they're called viable. Yeah. So that means that it's an emptiness yes, that can, yes, yes, yes. Lively, right? can yeah, impregnate. Lively. Yes, know? yes, yes. The vitality, vitality. Right? the liveliness, right, right. Very good, thank you. Yes, quite true, quite true, quite true. Thank you. The word vivification, vivify. Mm. Pardon me? To vivify? Or? Yeah. yeah, yes, quite true. Life. This realization, experience is one of the great ones. This is one of the great ones. This realization caused him to break into deep laughter, and he no longer felt himself oppressed by his body or mind. <laughs> experience? It's over. It's all over. It's all over. The question is answered. That's it. Quit. And this is the greatness of Esui. In an effort, experience, questioning authority, in an effort to learn whether this constituted true Satori, Basui questioned a number of well-known priests. Dharma combat now. He takes his questioning with authorities on a higher level. But none could give him a satisfying answer. Right? Because if they said, he's got them, doesn't he? He's got them on the horns of the ancient dilemma. Right? right? He's got them on the horns of a dilemma. Right? If he goes to the well-known monks and says, lays out what it is and somehow indicates it. If they say yes, that's true enlightenment, then they aren't able to see that he still has a profound question about the very nature of the experience. So he can leave them. If they say no, well, then he knows one thing, they can't judge his own experience. So he's got it, yes and no. Either way, he can leave them. He can leave the whole, the whole what? What do we call it? Seeking answers, verification. Leaves the whole area of verification. Profound step. At any rate, he told himself, I no longer have any doubts about the truth of the Dharma. He knows the truth of the Dharma. There it is, unfolded. I don't have any doubts about the truth of the Dharma. The question comes back. But, this, but his basic perplexity as to the one who sees and hears had not been dispelled. Yeah, 
That's right. Remember the either or? Well, then he got rid of the, the one with the either, and he still has the or. That is what's seeing and hearing at this very moment. He's only got run, rid of one. He still has the other, and he's had enough integrity to hold on to the other. But his basic perplexity as to the one who sees and hears had not been dispelled. And when he saw in a popular book one day, mind as host and body guest, every one of his old quiescent doubts suddenly resurrected. Now, notice the way he puts it. I have seen that the foundation of the universe is voidness. Still, what is, what is this something within me that can see and hear? I mean, there is, look, okay. Everything at the basis of nature, reality, is voidness. Viable voidness. Okay, good, good. Wait a minute, there's something right now that's seeing. I mean, there's something right now that's hearing. Okay, don't call it. Well, all right, wait a minute. Now, wait, there is still something there. What is it? Now he leaves Buddhism in that respect. Many would have stopped at this point. He desperately asked himself, anew. In spite of his every effort, he couldn't rid himself of his doubt. Still had the question. The question had him. See, he couldn't rid himself of the doubt. The question had him. That's the state. Now, during this time, I should mention that Basui did not enter temples. He uh, he didn't enter into the officialdom of Buddhism. He found doing zazen in temples too much of a distraction. He would often live by a zendo, but not be in attendance, though he would visit the, the roshi. And therefore, out of this experience, he generated another question. Let's see if we can see the next question, all right? What is it that sees and hears? But would you not agree, there is no possibility of your seeing anything that you don't recognize. Ever see anything you didn't recognize? No. Right? Yeah. You, can't, you can't see without recognizing. Ever try to drive down a highway and look at the signs and not read them? If you see it, you got to read it, right? You read it, right? Because seeing is recognition, right? 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 right. Say, so is that true just for the eyes, or is it equally true for the ears? What do you have to do to listen to the sound of someone's voice? Right? Can you separate it from what they're saying, or would you listen to? Okay, look here. Try not to. Try, just listen to my voice, just the sound of it, but don't pay any attention to what I'm saying. You're going to get what I'm saying, whether you like it or not. Recognition. Agree? Seeing and hearing, the mind is at work. Therefore, he changes the question and it advances another step because now he can say there's something that's doing this all the time. Well, if there's something doing there that all the time, then, hey. And who's the master? There must be something in me that's the master. Because whether I like it or not, I'm always recognizing, seeing and hearing everything I do. Therefore, there has to be some kind of master at functioning, right? Because that's what a recognition thing is, right? So therefore, he now shifts his question to this one. All right, what is it that sees and hears at this very moment? To who is the master? Now, who, of course, um, has a built-in prejudice, doesn't it, 
but we'll, we'll, right? Because who presupposes a person? He could equally have asked, what? But since he's talking about himself, who is the master, there's still that element that makes it into who rather than strictly speaking a what. He takes that question. To stay awake, he would often climb a tree perched among the branches mm -hmm. and deeply ponder his natural koan. See, this is a natural koan. This is not a formal koan. A koan that comes out of your experience in your own life, that's a natural koan. Who is the master far into the night, oblivious to wind and rain? In the morning, with virtually no sleep or food, he would go to a temple or a monastery for an interview with the master. Well, it reached a peak because we know this game that he's involved in, if they say yes or if he says no. In the course of his spiritual journeys, Basui eventually met the Zen master through whom his mind's eye was completely open, Koho Zenji, who must have been it. <laughs> right. Koho Zenji. Ah, interesting ad. Um, it's a, it's a, um, um, G for those, who don't mean, G, often in Japanese when they use the word G, that means a monastery or a zendo. So this is a koho, the, the master of a, of a, it depends on how it's spelled in the Japanese uh, pictograms. Too, Picture. Because there's about nine or ten J-I, but they're all different than the pictogram. A pictogram is an actual, instead of a word, it's more like uh, a drawn thought. Uh, yeah, oh, that's, right. that's right. That's right. Yeah, and this is what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. So what happened with Vesuvian and this guy? I don't know. I have to go further. I don't know. I'm going to get... <laughs> You want to know who killed the butler? <laughs> God. All right. yeah. It must have been very interesting because there's almost like a question. Pardon me, uh, do it again. It must have been a very interesting thing because it would be like two separate disciplines. The formal Zen coming from the Chief Buddhist mm -hmm. China mm -hmm. have the unanswerable cones mm -hmm. trying to jar you into mm -hmm. enlightenment while he is almost doing a Socratic questioning. Out of his experience, isn't it? Yeah, that's natural. right. And na that's what they call a natural koan. That's right. That's why I wonder formally whether we could even call him a Buddhist at this point. I mean, well, he's like moving he's into his own world of Buddhism, uh, which is probably what makes him great. Hell is almost Western. That's right. That's right. It has nothing to do, it seems like, with the chin that's right. of China that Bodhidharma brought up. But it, that's right. it has nothing to do with the, 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 the Tibetan bardo. That's right. Wait, what do you mean? Like, That's right. Wait, in mystic right. states, visions of hell and heaven are very common, aren't they? Yes, but the, not, not the classical Buddhist Like, sense. Like the wrathful deities in the Tibetan Book of the Dead? That's the, not supposed to be fun. No, see, start from the beginning. See, start from the beginning. Would you agree, how does he start? Who? Idea of a soul. Okay. Right? Again, that's not Buddhist. No. That's the one thing they would want to reject, and not, okay. not Buddhism, right? So it starts with a non-Buddhist orientation as a child, and he continues with this kind of dialectic, which includes images that are not strictly speaking Buddhist. And he doesn't stop at a Buddhist great experience of that viable emptiness. Yes, no, is there any mention in his work about the um, Bardo, like preparing the soul for the next reincarnation? Because it doesn't seem like that is part of his question at all. No. And that is such, no. a, uh, that is such a, uh, an important part of the Buddhist belief. You see, the, as, much as, we, as much as I have here, there, there's also a, a recent work that has come out about uh, recent, about 10 years ago, by Basui, uh, by his autobiographer. This comes from his biography, and there's some autobiographical references in the other book. But um, 
He's stepping outside of the tradition. He doesn't attend the ceremonies. He doesn't attend the zendos of the monasteries. When he finally made one up, he called it a, uh, a zenji, ji, with a, just a, a hermitage. Um, so just split it any time you want. Just kind of, okay. The lesser masters from whom Basui had sought guidance had all sanctioned his enlightenment. Therefore, he could leave them. But Koho, sensing Basui's keen, sensitive mind and the strength and purity of his yearning for truth, did not give him the stamp of approval, but he merely invited him to attend, neither yes nor no. Caught. His game is stopped. Now he attends. On his part, Basui recognized in Koho a great Roshi, but again declined to stay in his temple, taking a solitary hut in nearby hills for the next month, coming daily to see Koho. One day, Koho, sensing the ripeness of Basui's mind, asked him, uh, tell me, what is Joshua's move? Basui replied with a verse, mountains and rivers, grass and trees equally manifest move. Koho retorted, your reply has traces of self-consciousness. All at once, his biographer relates, but Sui felt as though he had lost his life route, like a barrel whose bottom had been smashed open. Sweat began to stream from every pore of his body. And when he left Koho's room, he was in such a daze that he bumped his head several times along the walls, trying to find the way to the outer gate of the temple. Upon reaching his hut, he wept for hours from his very depths. Tears overflowed, pouring down his face like rain. In the intense combustion of this overwhelming experience, Basui's previously held conceptions and beliefs were utterly destroyed. No answer, no beliefs, all destroyed. Power of the cone. Power of the cone. Hmm. Took it with, say, took it with such integrity. So, in this great game, in this great game, when it's played on this beautiful level, we know then that Basui comes in. He gives him that great koan. What is mu? Joshua's mu. He responds. According to the game, obviously, the Roshi then, Koho, sees his state, can judge his answer, is able to put what he sees both together in a retort to such a way that it would challenge the very foundations of his student's being. <coughs> That's playing the game on its highest level. That ability, that ability to do both and capture what he sees with another response that's able to capture his inner contradictions and lay it open for him so he has to see it, that's Zen on the highest level. And that's what's played for. And therefore, that brought him into an intense state in which all of his conceptions, beliefs were utterly destroyed. Please. What was the question he asked again? Pardon? What was the question he asked Basuri again? What is Mu? What is what? Mu. Oh. <coughs> According to tradition, uh, this question came from a story from Joshu. And uh, in this game of Dharma combat, where a monk can challenge a master, and if he's able to overcome the master with his responses or whatever they engage in, then he can gain status and power as a consequence, which is typically found uh, in the sixth patriarch. 
Now, one monk therefore came to Joshua and said, does a dog have a Buddha nature? Now, Buddha nature is fundamental. Another way of talking about Buddha nature is to talk about what we talked about before, viable emptiness. Well, when he's asked that question, he's on the horns of a dilemma again. If he says yes or no, he loses. Let's see if we can say that, all right? Because, by the way, would you agree I have this truck? Yes. If I have it, I'm, I can be separated from it. Yeah. If I have a shirt, I can be separated from a shirt. Does a dog have a Buddha nature? Mm -hmm. If you stay with that language, if he has, if a dog has a Buddha nature, then the Buddha nature is not essential to the dog. So if he says, if he says yes, well then, then <laughs> if he does have a Buddha nature, does he have it like you have that hat band? Then it's separated from you. If he says no, 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 you can't say dog has a Buddha nature. Does it have a Buddha nature that's not part of the nature of, of reality? How can that be? Must it not participate? So whether yes or no, he loses. So when the monk went to Joshua with this, does a dog have a Buddha nature? Just as fast, no, no time interval. Joshua turned to the monk and said, what's Mu? So he said, Mu, literally, he said Mu. And the monk walks away saying, well, what the, what, what's Mu? Whoever walks away with the question has the problem. So therefore, people are given the koan, what is Mu? And it reflects the story. What is Mu? What, what was Joshua's Mu? It's expressed in many ways. You can ask, say, what about that dog? Does the dog have a Buddha nature? That's one way. Uh, what is Mu? Uh, did uh, Joshua answer correctly? After all, uh, what is Mu? What did he say? Mu. Mu. Oh. It's like the answer to what's the sound of one hand clapping? Mu. <laughs> yes. What's that? Oh, what was your What was your face like before your parents were born? Yeah. Yeah. Stop a railroad train. Right. It's possibly atop the pole. I think that was one of the answers to what is Mu. The crow sits possibly atop the pole. Oh. He sits how? Possibly atop possibly the pole. Well, also in, in calligraphy, calligraphy, this is without, mm -hmm. right? That's and if you're possibly without, you need yeah. Mm -hmm. right, that's it. But it's not, it's not like the questions are directly a part of, of the answer, or the answer directly part of the question. You have to let your mind try to go to the next level and rid level. yourself of the physical to approach the void. And the void doesn't mean nothing like what was mm -hmm. mm -hmm. The void is something else. Yeah, well, viable answer. Is it like saying the losing grants tune? Pardon? Is it like saying the losing grants tune? <laughs> Who's buried in grants tune? I mean, Grant. No, because that's concrete. Yeah, that's that's. Um, try it this way. Do, do, do you have a uh, do you have a fundamental nature? Do you have a fundamental nature? Well, do you think you part in some way? Is there something about you that's real? That in some in some way shares in reality? Yeah, that's good. How about yourself? Would you say in any way you, sh you in some way participate in reality? Do I? Yeah, do you? Is there anything about you that is real? Through, through relationships. Pardon? Through relationship. I mean, oh, but not in your soul. Well, then what is the soul? If it only exists through participating with others, only in relationships. 
Is there nothing there by itself? I mean, mustn't there be something there that participates, or is it just the relationship? Whoever I am, whatever that is. Yeah, see, taking that, taking that as your question is the game. What is it in you that is seeing and hearing right now? Is that the same thing as a you? It's the willingness to take on this question and, and live it that becomes this very beautiful game called pursuing the question, the quest, the quest of the question. And the question of does a dog have a Buddha nature? If it doesn't, then life force and soul are not the same thing. You go into but a whole different question. If the dog doesn't have it, then you see, even an illusion must have some kind of reality. Doesn't the dog, does he have it? Does he leave it at the corner? So if life force and soul are not the same thing, then you have two different questions going at the same time. Mm. If yeah. they are the same thing, then does the dog have a soul? He keeps yeah, it's the same. Does the dog have a soul? Mm -hmm. Is there something real about a dog? Well, let me look. What does he do? What does he do after this? The following evening, Basui came to tell Koho what had happened. Hardly had he opened his mouth when Koho, who had despaired of ever finding a true successor among his monks, declared as though addressing all of his followers, my dharma will not vanish, all may now be happy, my dharma will not disappear. Koho formally conferred Inca on his disciple and gave him the name Basui, which means high above average. All right, so then that's a dharma transmission. When the teacher can recognize in the student the same state of enlightenment that he himself participates in on that most meaningful level, then he can then give dharma transmission, and that's called enka. Wow. Now, Basui remained for two months near Koho, receiving his instructions and guidance. But Basui had a strong and independent mind, which wished to... <laughs> wish to mature his profound experience through dharma combat with accomplished masters so as to integrate his experience thoroughly into his conscious mind and to his, and to his every act and to develop his capacity to teach others. So he left Koho and continued to live in an isolated life in forest hills and mountains not far from temples and famous masters. When not engaged uh, when not engaging them in Dharma combat, he would carry on his zazen for hours. He continued, he stayed with it. Right, he still stayed with it. Still went on and tested it and confirmed it. Therefore, he returns to the cycle again, doesn't he? And continues it. He never gave it up. Now, many people, of course, then um, uh, slowly came around him and their group grew and he resisted their efforts to make him their teacher, but uh, finally uh, too many of them crowded around him, so he s decided he might as well teach him. He built a hut in a mountain, and uh, now his enlightenment had ripened, and feeling himself capable of leading others into emancipation, he no longer turned away his seekers, but willingly accepted all who came. Soon became a, quite a flock. Now, this man, by the way, in the end, had a thousand monks living around him. He was a very powerful teacher. Now, here's the part I like most of all. At the age of 60, just before he passed away, Basui sat up in the lotus posture, and to those gathered around him said, don't be misled. Look directly. What is this? He repeated this loudly, calmly died. So in the end, what did he carry with him? A question. And therefore, I often say that they are many great masters, but Basui certainly was one of the greatest. 
his teaching methods and the teaching methods of every great master grow out of his own personality, his spiritual problems as he experienced it, and the mode of Zazen which gave birth to his enlightenment. Pardon me? Did they all sit in trees? Did they what? Sit in trees. No, 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 they didn't all sit in trees. No, oh, they were always out on a limb. They were always out. Good. Yes. The Sui's natural koan, who is the master? What's the tool he used? He urged his, his disciples to employ this mode of Zazen. Moreover, since Basui, like Dogen, could not wholly satisfy his deep inner longing for liberation through shallow enlightenment, the goal he holds out in these letters is nothing short of full enlightenment. Therefore, his sermon on one mind and the letters that he wrote outlines the practices of this very, very, very profound Zen master. Hmm? No. No. No, because uh, uh, that's a real nice lecture, and uh, uh, it has so many stages of development in it that. Um, it would take, you know, you have to do, be fair with it, and it's four pages, and I only went through three pages in an hour, so four pages would be. But I can hit a couple of high points. One special one. Um, yeah, here's the, here's the concluding, one of the concluding paragraphs in this. Sermon on one mind that he gave. At work, at rest, never stop trying to realize who it is that hears. Even though your questioning becomes almost unconscious, you won't find the one who hears, and all your efforts will come to naught. Yet, sounds can be heard. So question yourself to an even profounder level. At last, every vestige of self-awareness will disappear and you'll feel like a cloudless sky. Within yourself, you will find no eye, nor will you discover anyone who hears. This mind is like the void, yet, as in a single spot that can be called empty. This state is often mistaken for self-realization. Continue to ask yourself even more intensely, now who is it that hears? If you bore and bore into this question, oblivious to anything else, even this feeling of voidness will vanish and you'll be unaware of anything. Total darkness will prevail. Don't stop there. Keep asking yourself with all your strength, all right, what is it that hears? Only when you have completely exhausted the questioning will the question burst. Now you'll feel like a man come back from the dead. This is true realization. Is that great? Mm -hmm. Is that great? That's great. Right? That's great. That's great. That's great. That's great. Look that's at right. the sixth patriarch. Is that the sixth Indian Chinese or no, Zen? No, no, no. That's Chinese. Chinese. Sixth patriarch. Mm -hmm. Wayne Nam. Yeah. 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 We should talk about him. See, the question bursts. Right? Hasn't an answer. It bursts. And then what do you do? Still want to sharpen it. Still want to sharpen it right to the end. Right? Maybe the best thing to do is he could have walk out with that great one. What is it that's dying right now? <laughs> but I like 
look directly. What is this? Yeah, that's really very, very fine. Well, he wrote many letters, about 10 of them. They're all fine. They're all very fine. And one of the great values of this book, Three Pillars of Zen, is that it includes those letters and this essay. And I really uh, urge everybody to memorize it. Take it, take it. It's one of the great pieces of literature. And I really enjoy the opportunity to talk about it this evening. Yeah. Oh, I just thought that was great. Yeah, so did I. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to memorize that now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.